You're listening to Robinson Ventures Radio, where ingenuity meets innovation. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. This is Ian Robinson and the latest episode of Robinson Ventures Radio. Very happy to have on the call and on the episode today, Dr. Frank Knoppel. I've known Frank now. What we were figuring out in the last meeting we were in, Frank, two and a half, three years now? Yeah, it's uh, three years. At least. Today, we're going to talk about Frank's personal journey for innovation and entrepreneurship. Then we're going to talk about his really, really cool drone company, Blue Flight. So, Frank, um, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and why you're Dr. Frank Knoppel? So I'm, I'm an aerospace guy. I, I, I just like aerospace, uh, anything that flies. Um, I grew up in Germany. I did my first PhD in, in the, actually both PhDs in the UK in Cranfield. First thing out of uni is start a business in the aviation sector. Moved then on from that a couple of years later into strategy consulting, where I spent a lot of time actually in aircraft flying around and consulting the big companies on strategic topics. And during that time, had the epiphany that I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I need to build things. I need to make things. I want to see how things are evolving. And I was kind of looking for the next big thing. And for me, there's two, maybe three essential ingredients to uh, starting a company. And it, it all starts with passion. I and mean, starting a company from scratch is hard enough. And, and if you're not passionate about it, it's, it's almost impossible. You know, you need that drive to always be at a hundred plus percent, no sleep, <laughs> uh, work nonstop and, um, give literally everything that you have. So the underlying motivation uh, needs to be there. Uh, second, something essential is there is a real problem that you provide a solution for and, and have sort of a, a purpose or a higher purpose attached to it. And uh, thirdly, is starting from a almost like a greenfield situation where you have all the way to build something from scratch. And that's where you really create value and reap the benefits in the, in the mid to long term. Coming across challenges in logistics, and I mean, logistics is a very broad term, and it's anything where you need to move an object from a point A to a point B, whether this is your parcel deliveries, whether that's your the, the new business models around food or shopping deliveries, whether that's defense settings or industrial settings, but underlying is a limitation of what current technology can offer you in terms of speed and cost, right? So if you needed to deliver a parcel in an urban area, there is traffic on the roads. Um, you may not get there in time. It takes a, it takes a while. And then you need to pay a premium if you, if you're really in a hurry. And similarly, if you wanted to access any remote locations, you need a helicopter that's very expensive. And, and so, so th there's always a trade-off between the speed of getting somewhere and, and how much it costs. And then there is an accessibility aspect to it as well, like getting anywhere downtown or in a forest or a remote island or in the mountains, et cetera, can be a real challenge. There's a safety aspect associated with it, whether that's on road or in the air, on the water. And, um, and then there is an environmental aspect attached to it. So anything that we're currently using that's moving cargo around is powered by fossil fuels. And that's kind of the spectrum of challenges that call this the logistics industry in general faces. So the thinking is if you can use a drone in logistics, it will solve all these challenges at the same time. Uh, the drone is airborne, so it can reach pretty much anywhere, anytime and at high, very high speed because the drone is much smaller. It's unmanned. It doesn't carry a human to operate it. It should be a lot cheaper than what's currently offered. It runs on batteries, so no emissions. It doesn't require infrastructure. So you, need a, you shouldn't need a runway. It should be able to launch from anywhere, pick up a package, deliver it wherever you want. So access becomes um, also not a problem anymore. And um, because it's unmanned and you actually take traffic off the roads, it's, it's a facilitator of increased safety. So looking at that as an opportunity for me became a no-brainer. I'm like, well, if you figure out how to use drones in the logistics industry to make deliveries, 
you're disrupting like a trillion plus dollar global industry. It's worth giving it a try, right? And this is about seven, seven or eight years ago by now, where the drone technology wasn't as evolved. You know, I put my mind behind it and I thought, okay, let's let's look into this deeper. And then there were a couple of questions to answer first. So are are we a tech company? Do we do we play in the in the hardware or in the software space or both? And we provide the essential capabilities to enable this industry? Or do we use technology to provide a service, use drones to speed up deliveries? Um, or do we play somewhere else in the whole value chain and just provide the components? Or you know, do we do all of it? And, and this, this is a very essential question when you launch a company. Overall, I'm, I'm an engineer. So, I mean, you know, we joke about it. So double two PhDs, and, right? And, and something in engineering and? They're both aerospace. The second PhD was kind of an accident, but it happened. But so that's... I don't think I've ever heard of the accidental PhD before in my life. <laughs> so I think, I think this is kind of the, the comfort zone, right? Tech. Secondly, when you, when you look at the things that you need to do to make this work, the KPI here is how much does it cost to get a package delivered from a point A to a point B? And because drones essentially are actually not that expensive, what makes the use of drones expensive is getting people involved. You need to have these drones as autonomous as possible to get to the right price point. And when you make them autonomously, then you can equally be the manufacturer and put them out because the role of the operator is in the longer term still to be defined, right? So it's almost becoming the same thing between operator and and OEM. So I thought, well, if we if we are the OEM, a a, a drone for logistics didn't exist. B the aspect I just described, and lastly, as the OEM and the tech company, you build the you, you build IP and value, right? And and while we're having a lot of fun, there's also a business element to it. We want to make money with that, and the money is in the IP we're building. So it became a no-brainer. We're like, okay, we need to we need to become a tech company. We need to enable this industry by providing the best possible platform. And our customers will be the drone operators. And that was the starting point in 2018. So the first thing we've done, we looked into who, who would be buying this stuff? Who would be our natural beneficiaries, right? Essentially creating a customer profile and doing some customer discovery. Correct. And I mean, there's the obvious names and all, all the logistics companies playing in that space. But then there's also other industries that benefit, like in oil and gas or healthcare, and I mean, you can so you can figure out who the players innumerable, are. Innumerable, innumerable use cases, yeah. So, so we really spent several months getting hold of people in these industries and talking to them. The questions we were asking is like, so if if you had a drone, under what circumstances would you use a drone? to streamline your operations. There was a common th- topic and it's cost, it's the price point. But then secondly, it's reliability and reliability is a very broad term as well. So it's robust technology that's not easy to break, that flies regardless of any weather. It has to work, right? There cannot be any excuse why the drone is not airborne. There's also an element of scalability. So people are not interested in just one, two or 10 drones. They're interested in like fleets of hundreds or thousands of drones. and that need to work as an ecosystem and you need to be able as an OEM to actually provide these units and aerospace in general is not known to be a high volume industry. There's probably as many aircraft in this world as there are being cars produced every day. And then there is a, because we're, I mean, we're talking about flying machines or robots and there's the regulatory part as well. So, so these were recurring themes and we took those to the drawing board and started blueprinting solution space. The first observation that came really quick is this is not just the hardware thing, it's both hardware and software. Because once once you get, once you become too complex and you're talking about many, many drones, then there needs to be some software that coordinates the use of these drones and the deployment and the operation. And, uh, and then the actual design of the drone needs to be in a way so that you meet the requirements in the logistics space. And sometimes it's mundane things like, well, we're carrying packages, so the drone should have a cargo hold. And it, it's mundane, but when you looked at the drones, and even today, many drones or most drones 
don't have a cargo hold and they're trying right. to transport packages. So if it rains, it can it's get wet, it's getting wet. It's not protected from the outside environment. And you would think it's a logical thing, but you know, it needs to be incorporated in your design. You go in and you've looked at this multi-trillion dollar marketplace that's ripe for disruption. You've settled in and using your you know, unique skill set. You're settling in on the av aviation, so now you're settling in on drones, right? And you're defining through customer discovery, not just the, the singular problem you're solving, it's also a layered problem, right? And so you may have a initial thesis of discovery, right? But now you're also into the, and here are all these sub, you know, problems that are part of this calculus that you're then using to create product service offering number one. Correct. It's multi-layered, which makes it a non-trivial task yeah. on every aspect, not just engineering, also on the business model and, and you know, who, who are your customers? Who, how do you talk to your customers? Um, how do you sell your product? How do you price it, et cetera? And it's very strongly hypothesis driven, right? You can only figure out whether you do the right thing by doing it, but you can minimize the risk by putting your brain to work and really think it through first and not just by sitting in a dark room and coming up with your own ideas, but leveraging the opinion of the players in the industry that you want to disrupt, right? And I think that's a very important first step and starting point. And I think that's a strong differentiator for us as a company as well. We're not tech driven. We're not, oh, let's, let's build a drone and then try and find somebody to actually buy it. We're like, well, let's first understand what people want and what the problems are delayer the onion right until we get yeah. to the core and then start building right and, and and that's a very important step it's huge i mean i don't know how many times i've seen solutions that have been created that are looking for a problem right instead of somebody truly understanding what the core of the problem is and then wrapping a solution around it the way folks like i come back around to the way i met frank was through acadian you know and we at acadian we're doing a lot of talking about what does innovation look like within Acadian? And we, we quickly came to, a, are we a healthcare company that uses transportation or are we a transportation company that delivers healthcare? And what became quickly evident was, oh my gosh, look at the fleets of vehicles that we own, right? We own trucks and ambulances and helicopters and airplanes. And then within that, there were specific use cases for all of them. The one use case that existed that could be solved with the drone couldn't be solved with either an ambulance or a helicopter, right? It's this sort of interstitial space where it's definitely an emergent situation and it's how do you get supplies to that emergent situation? Or it can be how do you deliver healthcare through a specific thesis because these folks who are driving these, these, these various different pieces of equipment can't get there in a timely fashion because of lack of infrastructure, right? Very rural, remote locations. And so what impressed us about you and Blue Flight was that you had peeled, what did you call peeled the onion, right? You had peeled that onion to the point like nobody's eyes were watering is a joke I'm gonna use, but you understood what that, what that core was about. So much so to the extent that now we've been very lucky, and I think we're allowed to announce this. You know, the you know the Department of Transportation, U.S. Department of Transportation, has issued a a thesis uh, 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 around how to use drones to deliver blood to crash scenes, right? And so we've been very lucky to be awarded that SBR through that partnership. What's been brilliant is you've you've developed the platform, right? A platform is both a drone and fleet management software of that drone. And now you're able to sit there and say, okay, well, we can take that platform and that solution and these services and apply them to healthcare, defense, logistics, right? What does that use case look like that we can then take this well thought through and hyper-defined solution and product? Let's, let's come back around. So you're not the only founder of Blue Flight, are you? No. So today we're, we're a small team. We're really nimble, which I think is an advantage, but we need to grow. We also know that, and we're in a pretty good spot. I do that next uh, sprint uh, of, of growth uh, to the next level. And I think we're a really good team. We complement each other with 
little overlap, right? So we're both utilizing and using our skill set to the full extent and um, the way that responsibilities are split up. My main reason to be around here is to make sure there's money in the bank. And James's role is to develop the technology and, and run the company on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And easier said than done, uh, both of these roles. Um, but I, mean, I understand the tech, I have all the technical background, and everything, but uh, I stay completely out of it, except the, the more strategic topics. And then there are certain things like when we talk to customers, we do it together. Or if we go to trade shows, we do it together. So James McLaren is your co-founder. How did you meet James? Is he from the aerospace industry? I mean, how did you guys come together to form Blue Flight? So when Blue Flight first came to life, the group of people that started, one of the people knew James from university. So that's how we first met and then worked as a larger group for the first two years until 2020. And then, I mean, Corona kind of created a bit of a mess and then James and I took on the task of taking the company to the next level. And uh, that was actually a very important time for us. Uh, so when everybody ramped down and tried and, and wait and, and see what happens uh, with COVID, uh, we actually signed a $2.7 million contract in the Middle East for drone operations. So that was a pretty, pretty big uh, achievement from our side, I think, to uh, not scale back, but uh, ramp up during that time. Yeah, it was it was a really interesting time. There's so many stories that I'm hearing coming out from companies such as yours. They had just gotten themselves up, you know, in some initial funding. They they they're moving forward, and then you know, coronavirus and COVID hit, right? And the world changes. The companies that made it through were pretty. Their in ingenuity was you know as high as it, it, it had to be. You know, I'm thinking of a company um, we've had on this before, and we go sideways here for a second called Hamper. They're a multi-sided marketplace that are solving the wash dry fold, you know, industry, right? You know, they had just gotten started. They had just added their MVP and COVID hits. And then we as, as at the health system at the time, through our innovation funds, we came in and said, hey, look, we get you're trying to solve wash dry fold to residential and direct to consumer. But what we really need are delivery of medications right now. And your platform, which can, you know, do the appropriate routing of, hey, here's a person who wants to wash your laundry and hey, here's a person who has laundry to wash. We repurpose that back end to sit there and say, hey, here's a person who needs drugs and here's, you know, our pharmacy that we own and our 340B and how do we get those drugs to them? And so that's what kept them alive. That truly is what kept them alive and running for a period of time until they could perfect that calculus. Then they move on and now they're in 26 different metroplexes across the U.S., while offering direct to consumer wash dry fold. And they've come back to also a commercial thesis, which is, oh, by the way, there are certain parts of a commercial industry that require wash dry fold as well. And in this instance, it's short term rentals. Like, so people who go on Airbnb or, you know, VRBO or one of those that do those bookings, right? Well, laundry needs to be done for that. And so now they're solving it in that. And, and the reason I'm blabbering on about this is, it seems, Frank, that you had a similar sort of, oh man, here's coronavirus. We just got this massive contract, but now we need to deliver on that contract and, and continue to think through how are we you know, doing something and adding value at the same time. Yeah, the, I think the contract came almost after the virus hit first. Uh, so instead of sta standing still and waiting it out, we did the opposite and just went full speed. And uh, I think that was the uh, best decision for, for us as a company in an early stage startup. And at that time, we were only a handful of people that made us to who we are today. We were able to roll out the tech. We were able to take the tech into a real world environment, test it, learn from it. And plus, we're talking about a place that's about, I don't know, 10, 15 flying hours away from headquarters, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, the, which created all sorts of its own challenges. Oh, I mean, uh, nothing was flying at that point in time and nobody's being flown by a drone. So, <laughs> right. It's like, you know, how are you going to get from point A to point B? And that had to be, and then how do you get the logistics of, Hey, we've got these drones built for you. How do we get the drones over there during all that? I mean, talk about creativity and innovation. Well, we figured it all out and for, um, for sure. Yeah, and I think that's about the time when, when we ran into each other as well. 
um, yep. you, you and I with, with Acadian. Yeah, absolutely. It took some time, right? So healthcare is hard for a reason, right? Everybody thinks about it. It's a very traditional industry. And I know it's about taking care of people, right? So when I talk about, oh, it's an industry, people are like, it's not an industry. It's I'm like, no, no. It's 18% of our GDP industry, right? And so, you know, and oh, by the way, the people who run it are trained to be risk averse. Because if you introduce risk into the healthcare ecosystem, it equates to death in many of these folks' minds. And it's true, right? If you didn't have the checklist manifesto by Altu Gawande to get implemented in surgery, you know, you had higher instances of bad outcomes, right? And so how do you take aviation and apply it to healthcare? That checklist manifesto was 100% aviation applied to healthcare, right? It took us a while because, you know, you have this 50-year-old traditional, they, they run trucks, they run ambulances, they get this stuff done, and they do it hyper well. They do it, you know, with high quality and high fidelity. And now you're trying to disrupt that a little bit by saying, oh, by the way, we're going to fly stuff with a drone to these locations, right? And so it took us a little bit of the, a little bit of that flywheel to start spinning. But now that it's started to spin, they've raised their hand and said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be your swimming buddy on a quarter of a million dollar grant to fly blood to a crash scene. And we'll help you develop those protocols, by the way, to do that, right? Hey, and then, oh, wait, you want to go after a $2.5 million grant opportunity with the DOT to do post-catastrophic event, event, weather event delivery of healthcare to rural patient populations? Yeah, sure, we're in, right? It took that amount of time, right? And that type of patience and consistency. But the other thing, Frank, that you didn't get to see that we did was as you went through your milestones of growth, we were able to report that back in to sit there and say, hey, look, this is a pun intended fly by night. You know, this is a real company and this is what they're doing to move forward. And I can tell you right now, a lot of the work that Robinson Ventures does for our healthcare partners like Acadian, like MUSC, is they struggle with, look at all these new companies that are trying to come in and disrupt healthcare. How do we even evaluate them and think about them? And if they're, you know, and, and, and are they solid? Because if they're not, I'm not going to standardize some work that I'm doing, you know, of a seven, eight billion dollar health system on a company that may not be here in 18 to 24 months because they can't get their business model perfected. Right. Yes. And so for for us, when we sat down and and and, and for everybody who listens to this, it, you know, Frank and I met through Acadian. Now Robinson Ventures is supporting Acadian as they move forward, right? You're in the process of moving through that next round of fundraising. That round of fundraising, based on your model right now, should be it. And away you guys go, right, with uh, the various different solutions. So, Frank, talk about some of those solutions for us and, and what you're doing right now for folks to understand, oh, yes, we're in healthcare, and this is the cool stuff we're doing in healthcare. And then maybe if you could talk about some of the other you know, relationships that you have that you're moving forward in the uh, defense space, in the retail space, Right, if you could, please. Yeah, I don't even know where I start here. Well, let, let's talk about the, the tech maybe first and, and the hardware. We, we don't have just another drone. It's a drone that was designed and built to meet all the requirements in the logistics space. And even as a person not versed in the, or with drones, you will probably see the differences immediately. It's a different kind of drone. Uh, sometimes I would call it even it's an aerial delivery robot. It's got a lot of features that other drones don't have. And that's why it also took us quite a bit of time to develop it and get it right. But it does things like reliable operations, flying in all weather, being all electric, all these things I mentioned earlier. I and mean, you asked me about James's background and I think one of the challenges in the drone industry in general is how do you scale it up? Scale is not just flying hundreds or thousands of drones at the same time, it's actually making enough drones or producing enough drones in a short enough time period. Because when this industry starts exploding, you can't go back to the customer and say, oh yeah, we, we can have your drones in like six months. It's not acceptable. So James's background is actually automotive engineering. 
my background in aerospace and James's automotive, it's kind of the overlay and taking the best of both worlds. So I contribute a lot of the initial conceptual design of the drone. And by the way, it's patented. So it's differentiated enough that the US gave us a patent. We now have it uh, patented in Europe as well. The different features are, well, differentiating the, the, the drone itself enough to be unique in that sense. But what we have on top of that is taking automotive elements and superimposing it on the drones that we can scale this up sufficiently, right? And that includes materials, that includes the way the drone is designed for the purpose of manufacturing it at low cost, but still high quality, right? And these are all things that in the traditional aerospace didn't exist. Like I said earlier, if you buy an aircraft, then you don't care whether it's 5 million or 10 million or $100 million because that industry by itself, and, and you mentioned healthcare is risk averse, well, aviation is even more risk averse probably, or to the same <laughs> amount. Um, but now we're going into a territory where, well, you, you cannot be not risk averse, but where you need to address technical aspects. And, and because the drone by sheer geometry, because it's so small, right, you, you can actually now innovate and take these outside elements into the aerospace sector to produce a product that hasn't been there before, right? And, that, and you inject all these new technologies. Like our drone is mainly 3D printed. We can implement 3D printing to make these drones in a very short time period. We're not using carbon fiber and you know, the process is very manual. It takes a long time to make a carbon fiber element. Uh, it's very cost intensive. And uh, while well, we can produce a drone in a 3D printer about a day, right? So if the printer runs 350 days a year, you, that one printer makes 350 drones. And if you actually look at the capex of that 3D printer, then very little cost compared to having a drone that's made from carbon fiber. I, I cannot pinpoint just, you know, what, what are we working on right now because it's so multifaceted. But the big topics for us is scaling production and or, or, or scaling in, you know, in general. It's further refining the tech to even better meet the requirements around speed and, and cargo capabilities and uh, different use cases and applications that the drone can be used for. And I give an example, right? If you say, well, I want to deliver a package from a point A to a point B. Well, let's think about the process, right? So do you put the package on the drone? Like, is that a human being? Is that a robot? Is the drone airborne while the package is being put on? Is it on the ground? And then stupid things like, do you put the package from the top of the drone or from underneath? And then when you deliver the package, do you just fly over your target zone and you just drop the package, but then it will fall down and things inside will break? Or does the drone land and you eject the package? Or does somebody take it out? Or do you winch it down? There's a myriad of different ways to deliver a package by drone. What we've done through our design is we enable each of these ways to deliver a package. You mentioned earlier Narcan or, or EpiPens, right? They should be yep. preloaded. They should be as quick as possible to the destination because they're probably wanted in the shortest possible time. And an EpiPen can be in a case that's shock resistant. So you probably just hover over the destination point. Now, when you're talking about a defibrillator, it may be a different situation because it's a more sensitive um, instrument and you probably don't want to drop it. So you winch it down, right? And through design and through ingenuity, we were able to meet the requirements for all these different delivery modes. And that's something unique as well and speaks to a lot of different customer and customer types. Yeah. But the drones we see in the market, they can maybe do one or two of these delivery yep. types, but not all right. of them. We have a partnership with the company DroneUp, and they recently announced their drone delivery system. And DroneUp is a well-established uh, company that's been around for several years, and they're flying for Walmart. So in, in some states, you can get your Walmart shopping delivered by drone when you order it on the app. Now in their ecosystem or part of the ecosystem, and that was just announced a few months ago, is it's an oversized box, man high, and uh, inside there is a whole robotic system where somebody can just walk up to that box and, and put the, the cargo 
inside, and then inside you have various robotic mechanisms that load the cargo automatically onto the drone, and then the drone takes off and flies it to wherever it's needed. We meet the requirements to integrate with the technology, right? And lots of drones just don't, because they may be designed that you can only load it from the top, and then yep. that really doesn't work anymore. One of the things that it's interesting about drone up, and this is something I had to learn from you, Frank, which is, you know, if you're flying a drone, you have to be able to, for the most part, as a drone pilot, you have to be able to see your drone and you have to have your, your licensure, right? I got to learn what BVLOS meant, right? Which is, I just thought, oh, look, you can fly it and there's GPS in the sky and it'll be great and blah, 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 blah. Well, BVLOS stands for beyond visual line of sight, which means you as the pilot can no longer see the physical drone. And you're literally, this drone is flying from point A to point B, dropping off whatever it is, and then returning. And you only get to see it when it's maybe taking off and coming back. And so I had to learn about the entire regulatory overlay from the FAA that includes a specific licensure to go be able to do BVLOS. And there's only a handful of companies in the U.S., that actually have that certification and drone ups one of them. That's not true. That's not true. And it's also the interplay between operator and uh, drone supplier. Yeah. Um, and to make things even more complex, we as a company making drones, we also have to comply with regulations so that the drones can be operated beyond the visual line of sight. And, and one very important step was to get the remote ID compliance. And there's new regulation that's being put out. Uh, remote ID is literally. Uh, um, a receiver on the drone that broadcasts a signal to deconflict any traffic in the air between drones, right? And uh, but you need to go through a process, and it needs to be approved. And to, uh, we just got the compliance issued a couple of weeks ago. Where do you see Blue Flight going here in the next, you know, I'd say, eighteen to twenty-four months? If I step back from that question, I think the first question is always, maybe the, the, the actual question to ask is where do you see the drone industry moving and how do we position Blue Flight and, and grow with it? We've seen a lot of signals this year, 2024, uh, that show how the drone industry is emerging from a steady growth to more of an exponential growth curve. And that's not just true for the drone industry in general, but particularly on the, on the cargo side as well or, or delivery use case. So I think with that onset of growth and they're forecasting double digit up to 50% a year of, of growth in delivering cargo by a drone, um, I think Blue Flight is very well positioned to be one of the top players. Right? If, we, if we look around as to who else is playing in the segment, yep. but as a, as a purebred cargo drone OEM, in the US, there's really not many, right? And, and we stand out there and, and we have the patent and you know, we have the uh, discussion with the bigger names. Um, so, I, so I think that already gives us a lot of comfort and tells us we're on the right path here. And depending on how the trajectory of delivery drones in general, and this is in the US, but also globally is, is pounding out, we, we can be a, a really high growth, very attractive company to watch in the next five years, right? And as the CEO and founder and all of us in the team and, and whether that's advisors or investors, we're obviously very excited about this opportunity because uh, and this is probably a once in a lifetime opportunity to be part of something like that. It, it doesn't happen all the time. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, we've seen Right now we're seeing, you know, everybody's talking about AI coming on board and that's a once in a lifetime. And then I come back around to like, you know, we're old enough in Generation X that we've got, we got to see the birth and the dawn of the internet and the social media. There are these really interesting inflection points that if you come in at an early stage in a company like Blue Flight, all of a sudden, I just think about it. Like, I think all the companies that exist that I use day to day to run Robin's Ventures, that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago, right? And this is a whole brand new space. Final question. What is one question that I didn't ask you that I should have? Um, maybe that's the one question you shouldn't have because I don't have the answer right now. You know what? One thing that everybody asks me is always, what about regulation? Maybe for the people who listen to this and, and haven't been in, in touch with drones in general. So yes, regulation is important. It's not prohibitive. 
uh, drones are flying as of today. Regulation is also a global phenomenon, right? So every country or sometimes state or even down to cities have their own. But I think everybody has realized that drones is not a question of if, but when they're happening. Most of, if not all of the geographies we're looking at, they're preparing for it. And that includes governments putting the regulatory frameworks in place or having already rolled them out to enable the drone use case. And I mean, in the US, obviously the regulatory body is the FAA. 10 years ago, there was really not much of a framework to regulate the use of drones, specifically on the cargo side, but that has changed a lot in the last five plus years uh, through different programs that the FAA went through, first to identify what's actually needed and then start developing and then start implementing it. Um, We're expecting a pretty significant announcement this year, 2024, on regulatory changes that will make it easier, more streamlined, faster to use drones commercially for deliveries. And um, and we're very excited. We have some hypothesis as to what this will look like. And I mean, obviously, if you talk to the right people, then that's not really a secret. Similar trends is happening in other parts of the world, right? So whether that's Europe, whether that's um, Australia, where we, by the way, have an office as well, or, or other parts in Asia or Latin America, people have recognized the potential of drones. And in general, the governments are preparing for supporting the use of drones uh, on a commercial and not just commercial in general, but also for the delivery use case. Brilliant. Frank, thank you very much for your time today to record this podcast. And I certainly hope that we can find a time that aligns for us to actually come up to where you are in Michigan, uh, where you have your manufacturing facility for us to meet. I've never met Frank in person. We've done all of this for like the last three years through Zooms and Google Meets and you name it. So I think it's time for, for us to meet in person and then for me to watch one of these, these beautiful drones being made. Very Thank true. You. Very true. Well, you're, you're welcome. And, and I hope this is not in the too distant future. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Thank you, Frank.